Well, good morning. What a great day it is. I'm going to knock this over. <laughs> um, you know, I was thinking about this. You've heard me talk about a lot about how I was brought up, the way I was raised. And uh, I was raised in a very strict Christian home. Went to church all the time. And, uh, you know, growing up in church, let me explain this to you. Let me put this in the right context. My father was the associate pastor where we went to church. He also was the principal where I went to school. So I had no chance. None. I mean, it's amazing that I can even stand up here in even the right frame of mind and talk to you about anything because I'm sure my brain is completely messed up. I say that jokingly. I'm not serious. So growing up in church, there were just certain things we did. We called them spiritual practices. Now, going to church was a big one. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. In fact, one, one morning, I remember getting up for, for church, and I was sick. Man, my stomach was just killing me. I was a kid, you know, and just like any kid, you know, I was sick. And I remember going to my father and saying, Dad, I'm sick. I don't think I can make it to church. And he said, throw up and prove it. So I did. And he said, now don't you feel better? Let's go to church. <laughs> so going to church was such a major part of our family and it was a practice that we did every week. I'll tell you another big one was uh, praying. You know, that was always a big one. I mean, no matter what. They, in fact, they used to talk about praying without ceasing. I thought that meant you were praying and you'd fall asleep. And people would say, did you fall asleep while praying? Oh, no, no, I was praying without ceasing. So I always thought that's what that meant. And then reading the Bible. Just like this church has committed ourselves to Bible in a year, reading our Bible was very, very important in our church. But there was one practice that I never could understand. I could never wrap my mind around it. And it was the practice of fasting. Why would a loving God in heaven ask me to give up food? I couldn't understand it. I, I, did, I didn't want to do it. I said, God loves me. He would never ask me to do something like that. And yet, our church, each and every year, would do what they called a church-wide fast, where you give up food and only drink water for a spe specified amount of time. And it was always only like 24 hours. I mean, we're not talking people like three, four weeks. I mean, we're talking 24-hour period of time. And I'll never forget, our church had called this fast. And I went nine, the first nine hours, and I'm like, man, 15 hours more to go. Easy. And then it was time for breakfast because I had slept the first nine hours of my fast. <laughs> I figured if I'm not able to eat, I might as well sleep, because that's my other favorite thing to do. And I remember waking up, and all it felt like in church, I can't say this enough, it felt like the powers of heaven and hell were battling over whether or not I would eat. I mean, I could just imagine God's angels and the demons of hell fighting to make sure whether or not I would taste a morsel of food during this 24-hour period of time. In fact, it got so bad where I went to my parents. Now, I'm a parent. I have 11 year olds. You know who they are Brooklyn and Bailey. And anytime I start to hear quiver voice, I know that I'm about to hear something exaggerated. I'm about to hear something ridiculous. So I use quiver voice. Dad, um, God has called me to such amazing things. If I die from not eating, how will I accomplish those things? I said, Dad, God wants me to be this amazing Christian for the kingdom and make a difference. If I wither away to nothing because of this fast, what good will I be to the church of God? They didn't buy that. <laughs> they didn't buy it. And I would make excuses. Oh, my stomach just hurts. God doesn't want me to do this. And you know, I wish I could stand before you. Some 30, no, 20 something years, 30 years later, and tell you that I was overcome by the Holy Spirit and He gave me the strength to overcome the evils of food. I think I had a Snickers bar in the middle of that, so I, don't, I, I didn't make it. 
But what it said to me was this was a practice that as a church and as someone growing up in church, we just did every, every week. Well, today I want to bring your attention to something that is going to be a little different. Today I want to talk to you about a fast that we don't hear a lot about. But as we're going to find out as Isaiah is writing to Israel through the inspiration of God, we're going to find out what the true fast looks like. I want you to turn your your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 58. Now, if you have a Bible from our gathering space, and I hope you do, it's on page 514. If you don't have a Bible, please, at the end of church, take one. We'd love for you to have a Bible. Read it. Um, Just like I said, our church has made a commitment to this Bible in a year. Um, Start it up. We have Bible plans out in the gathering space. You know the role. Just do it. We, we, We want people to read their Bibles. But I want you to look with Isaiah chapter 58. Verses 1 through 4. Now this is, a, this is an interesting portion of scripture because we have in nine verses, we, it's broken up in about three segments. And the first is what we're going to see is God is calling out the nation of Israel. Okay? It says, shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and have you not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Now, this is just a side note. But, man, that is some kind of fasting service, right? I mean, these guys are fasting. That'd be like me and Danny over here. We're fasting. And at the end, I'm like, I want to punch this guy. I mean, did I not read that right? I mean, I'd be like, I don't like you, man. I want to punch you in the face because I don't know why. I just want to. And that's what they're doing. They're fasting and they're, they're, they're doing all the quote unquote right things. But oh, church, they're doing it with the wrong motives and they are completely lost. You know, I, I read this and I can't help but feel sorry for the nation of Israel. I mean, somewhere along the way, they've been given bad information. Somewhere along the way, someone said, oh, this fasting, it's about you. And it's what you can do. And it's all about you. And God is saying, no, no, it's not about what you do. You know, I remember, back to my ridiculous childhood, I, uh, I wanted to stay all night with this friend named Robert. And me and this guy, Robert, were, man, we were good friends. He was about three or four years older than me. And he come from a different situation, way different than, than what I did. But he was a good guy. And, and I always liked hanging out with him. One day, well, I used to ask my parents all the time, hey, can I stay all night at Robert's? I want to stay all night at Robert's. And then sometimes they'd let me, and then sometimes they'd be like, no, we don't want you to stay all night at Robert's. Well, this time I had a new strategy. I thought, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to clean my room. Now, growing up, my wife is sitting out here. She won't believe this. Growing up, I was a neat freak. I was like, I mean, people would sit on my bed and get up, and I'd smooth out the covers because I was afraid of it being messed up. Sorry, babe. I don't know what happened. (laughs) Those days are long gone. Um, Now it's like I leave a trail. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so I cleaned the room. My mom is much like I was as a kid, a neat freak. And I, I mean, her house was always clean, but I, I went in, man, I was spring clean and dusting everything, vacuuming, mowed the grass, did all these things. Not a word, didn't say anything to anyone. Got it all done. I went to dad and I said, I'd like to stay all night at Robert's. And dad goes, no. I said, What? He said, no. I said, but dad, did did you, I wasn't going to call this out. I wasn't going to kind of bring attention to it, but did you just see what all the things I did? He goes, yeah, I appreciate that. The grass needed mowed. (laughs) Bed needed made. How, you know, dishes needed done. I'm like, yeah, but I would think after all these things I did that surely you're obligated to do what I want you to do. You know, a little manipulation. Man, I'm telling you, every time the girls clean something on their own, I'm like, oh, here we go. (laughs) <laughs> they want something because <laughs> usually it's go clean your room. But if it's clean without us telling, then I'm like, okay, here we go. They're going to ask for something. And that's what the nation of Israel has done. They have said, look at us. Look at what we're doing. 
We're doing this fast, and you are not looking at us. You are not noticing us. Me and the nation of Israel, I love them to death, but oh, they just whined all the time. And they're just like, oh, but we are doing all these great things, and you just never notice us. God takes this. And you can imagine the nation of Israel is, I mean, it's like they're using God as this cosmic genie. You know, we just, you know, rub the lamp and God pops out three wishes. Boom, what do you want? And that's what the nation of Israel is doing. But God in his mercy is going to use this as a teaching lesson. And this is where I want us to go in this sermon today. Look with me in Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke. To set the oppressed free and break every yoke. As we continue in our sermon series, A Promise for the Future, I want us to look at our practice and a different kind of fast. The first fast I want us to look at is to loose the chains of injustice. Church, it should be our mission to help those who are downtrodden or those who are trivialized by their lot in life. Those who are enslaved to hurts, habits, hang-ups. Those who maybe have had bad relationships that have caused, or bad addictions, I should say, that have caused relationships to be severed. Now, you know what's interesting? When we look in the Bible and we see words like chains and injustice, it would be very easy for us to just kind of go towards the literal meaning of that. And maybe someone sitting in a jail cell who has been falsely accused. But I believe what the scripture is really talking about is those spiritual chains of doubt, those chains of fear, the chains that we carry around with us each and every day. How many of y'all heard the verse, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free? Most everyone in here. One day I was reflecting on that verse, and I, I do this often, part of my childhood rearing. And I thought to myself, I'm going to read that backwards, like opposite. So I read it this way, and you shall believe a lie, and the lie will enslave you. Now I want you to consider that for a second. If the truth will set us free, and yes it will, then the lie will enslave us. You say, what are you talking about, Danny? What I'm talking about, maybe when you were a kid, someone spoke something over you. Said, you'll never amount to anything. You're not smart. You know, you may as well just... You know, and if you do, I'm sorry. You may as well work at Speedway the rest of your life. If you do work at Speedway, I'm sorry. I just use that as an, you know. But that was, that's literally what this is talking about, is these lies that enslave us, these chains that bind us. And, and, and church, God has called us to loose those chains. He has called us to point people to Christ to point people to the, the Christ who can sever those chains, who can loose us from those things that maybe have been spoken over us. You know, all across this country today, people have walked into church. Even in this community, people right now as we speak are in church. Hundreds, if not thousands of people have gathered to worship God. And you know what I believe has happened I believe people have walked into church looking for something. I believe some have, are looking for hope. Some are looking for healing. Some are just looking for simple help. And God has called us to loose those chains that hold on to people. We are commissioned by God to help the least, the lost, the last those who have been trivialized, those who have nothing in this life, God has said, you, this is the fast that I've called you to loosen those chains. Maybe you're sitting out here and I, this is you. People have spoke things over you time and time again. And you just can't get over it. And even maybe things were spoken as a child, but even in your adult life, it's still, it's still playing out. Those records keep playing over and over in our head. Church, we have to loosen those chains. We have to point people to Jesus. And he is the one who will loose those chains. And when he does, 
He'll give them the freedom that only can be found through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. The second fast God is calling us to is to feed, clothe, and shelter the needy. Look with me in Isaiah 58, verses 7. And this is a continuation where he's talking about this is the fast I've called you to. He said, is, not, is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wonder with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Before I came to Shiloh, I was the worship leader of a church in Dayton called Shelter. I was there for about three and a half years. And while I was there, I came in contact with a guy named Nate Johnston. Now, Nate is this big, burly guy and just a, just a, I mean, a big teddy bear. I mean, the guy, when he hugs you, he just about knocks you down because he's just, you know, he's, he's a little bit goofy and clumsy, but he's just got a heart of gold. Well, he had a burden for the homeless people in Dayton, and, the, and he created or started this ministry called DSM, which was Dayton Street Ministry. And every Monday night, in fact, they still do it. Every Monday night, they go down to the downtown streets of Dayton to the huddled hundreds, if not thousands of people on the streets of Dayton, Ohio. And this is, his, this is what they do. He, he makes soup and he takes bottles of water. And he'll walk up to someone and say, would you like some soup? Would you like some water? And then he'll say, would you like some prayer? He doesn't preach at them. He doesn't tell them how wicked they are and this is why you're on the street and if you'd have done this, you wouldn't end up here. No, he just prays over them. Sometimes people say, no, I don't, I don't need any prayer. He says, okay, well, God bless you. Sometimes people say, you know, I really would like some prayer. The first time I ever went with him, we, we were down, I mean, it was the dead of winter. It was January. And he said, I want to go behind this Kroger's. He said, people I want us to go see. And so we go down this path, snow everywhere. I mean, it's cold. And as we kind of wind around this path, we come upon just a couple little areas. And one was this shack that a man had built with a hatchet. We knocked on his little makeshift door and he come to the door. And of course, we offered him the soup and water. And of course, he took it. Well, something resonated with this guy and with our hearts. And the, the thing that was so convicting and just, I still can't, get it out of my head was this church, or I should, I'm sorry, this shack that this guy lived in was less than a half a mile from the church that we attended. So each and every week we pile into this church singing praises to God and how great God is. And just beyond earshot is a man who has nothing. That guy actually, because of the love of Christ working in us and through us and helping him, he started coming to church. He'd walk to church every, every Sunday. One day he was sharing with uh, the pastor there that because this is not untypical, and this is not uncommon, he, someone had stolen his glasses. And I mean, when I met him, he had these pop bottle glasses. I mean, this guy could see the future. I mean, they were so thick. You know, he, could start, he was starting wildfires with his glasses. I mean, they were super thick. So Ryan says, well, come with me. And they went to this eye, you know, eyeglass store. Did, did the, the, the testing and everything and bought him a brand new pair of glasses. I mean, when he put them on, he was just like, I mean, it was like he was seeing for the very first time. They asked him and, and he was very honest about his situation. And they just asked him because one of the things that we found out in working in this ministry, uh, you have to be careful not to play hero. It's like this God mentality and this God syndrome where you want to just take people out of those uh, makeshift huts and stuff and just put them in an apartment because that's a little offensive to them. So we asked him, what, what could you use and what would you like us to do for you? And he said, you know, sometimes I get cold and I'd like a, just a coat. Someone went out and bought him this big Carhartt coat. I mean, big, heavy-duty Carhartt coat. This guy's sitting in church, and he ain't taking it off. I mean, he's sitting there like this. I mean, smile on his face. He can see. He's warm. And it was all because someone felt Christ compelling them to live out the fast that they knew God was calling them to do. And to show someone who is not in our circle, he's not in our sphere of influence, to show him love. For all I know, and, and, and he, he was when I end up coming here, the guy was still going to church and still actively attending this church. All because someone loved him. Loved him enough to do something for him and to live out that fast. Now what I love about this, I told you that this, this passage of scripture was broken down into three kind of 
dynamics. And the first one, you know, is God kind of playing parent. God's like, look, all right, I'm going to have to get on to you because you guys are doing this all wrong. But then God not just leaving them to their own demise. He says, okay, here's where the fast is. This is what I want you to do. But just classic God, this is what I love. He does this. He goes, let me show you what I will do if you'll do this. Look with me in Isaiah chapter 58. You see, with God, there's always hope. There's always grace and there's always mercy. So look with me in Isaiah 58, 8 through 9. It says, Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will come, will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer, and you will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. Church, here's the good news. When we do this fast, when we loosen the chains of the injustice, when we clothe, feed, and shelter the needy, God's favor will rest upon us. His light will break forth like the dawn. You will receive healing. We had a saying at this church, and I love this saying, and I, I say it, you'll hear me say it a lot. What has freely been given, we freely give. You know, Christ freely gave us life, grace, love. And we freely give that to someone else. You know, I can't help but read this portion of the, of the text and not think about Shiloh. I, yeah, I told you about my upbringing. Well, for 10 years from high, kind of, uh, let's see, 15, I guess it was, to 25, roughly. My math's a little fuzzy. For 10 years, I was on the road traveling and singing with my family. And we would go to 40, 45 churches every year. I am partly thankful for that because that's how I met my wife. But it, it was a very hard life, and it was, it was very difficult to be on the road all those years. But I say all that to say that I, I've been to a lot of churches, okay, <laughs> 45 times 10, and I'm sure there was more than that. But I've never been to a place where I have seen the favor of God resting like I see it here. We are a blessed church. Shiloh is a blessed church. But those blessings are not by accident. Those blessings haven't just appeared out of nowhere. You see, this church is living out the fast that God has caused. You say, what do you mean? The Anderson Food Pantry. Giving food to this organization that helps the needy. Hope for the homeless. Going down to the streets of Cincinnati and the parks, Pyatt Park, and passing out food, clothing. Shiloh Fest, 800 backpacks to the kids of this community, getting them off into the school year with a positive attitude. All the different mission opportunities that this church takes part in, going down to New Orleans or going up to northern Ohio and building you know, decks, painting, all the things that are basically doing for someone who cannot do for themselves and not expecting anything in return. Even more so, our commitment to our brothers and sisters in Price Hill who are looking, as we speak, to provide a daycare as well as after-school programs for the Price Hill community. Church, it's no accident that we're blessed. It's no accident that God's light is shining forth and shining on Shiloh like the dawn and that people have received healing in this place. That's no accident. Last Thursday, our pastoral staff, actually in uh, office staff, we went to Price Hill. We wanted to do a prayer walk in the city. And we started our prayer walk. Go ahead and show that picture. I think I put it in there. We started our prayer walk here, Echo Park. It's one of my favorite places in the city. And we gathered everyone around and I said, I'd like for us to just consider sometimes when we're in the midst of our work and last week, and I, I'm not trying to complain, but last week, you know, we had internet issues at the church. And, you know, you get wrapped up in all the things. You get wrapped up in the what and the how. I said, I want us to remember the why and the who. Why do we do what we do? And we were looking out at the city. I mean, this is our city. And we prayed over it and prayed that God would bless the city of Cincinnati we moved from there and went over to the church, Price Hill, and prayed into the children's rooms, prayed in the sanctuary, just to shower the place with prayer and love. 
I then asked Dorian, I said, where's a place where maybe there's been some activity happened that has kind of cast a shadow on Price Hill? A place that's not a place you want to visit at certain times of the day. And he said, well, I'll take you to a place. And we went to this parking lot. I think there was a family dollar and a mattress store. And as you're going up, I believe it's Glenway, there's like a brick wall or some kind of wall, and you turn in and go to the parking lot. And I want to leave you with this thought. We gathered in this parking lot, and we all held hands, and while we were sitting there holding hands, I was reminded of the words of Christ. When Christ was asked by his disciples, and maybe it was an honest question, or you know, sometimes they were trying to trap him or trying to figure out how to navigate, navigate through life, but they asked him a simple question. What is the greatest commandment of all? And Christ said something that this is what I just could not get away from. He said, love God, love each other. More specifically, he said, love God with your whole heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And as we stood in this circle, on a circle or on a street corner where at nighttime there's activities that happen that we would never want to be part of. Drug deals gone bad, prostitution, things that just are kind of a black eye to the community. And what kept ringing and just kept playing over and over my head is, what would this community look like if people just loved one another? What would it look like if people just loved each other like they loved themselves? I mean, let's be honest. We love ourselves. We, you know, the Bible even talks about we're, we clothe ourselves, we bathe ourselves. We, I mean, we, we feed each, you know, ourselves. I mean, we are we're pretty good to ourselves. But what would it look like if we loved our neighbor just the way we loved ourselves? And then God, in not an audible voice, it felt like it was louder, if that's possible, God said, the church has to model it. If this community, whether it's Price Hill or Delhi or the surrounding communities, if they're ever going to know what it means to love each other, the church has to model it. You see, like I said, when people walk into this church, they have to know that they are loved, accepted, cared for. In our pastoral meeting this morning, we were talking about this, and I said, you know, I really believe the church is a Holy Ghost hospital. This is a Holy Ghost hospital. And if this is a Holy Ghost hospital, then guess what we are? We're kind of like the nurses who prep the room, you know, prep the veins, tie the things around it, get ready to... And, and why? Because we're waiting for the great physician, the doctor, to come in and do his thing. But we have to do our part. And so when people come into this place, we can't just let them come in and just say, well, I hope they find God. You know? <laughs> I mean, I have him. I, I know where he's at, but I hope they find him. No, we have to model it because if we want our communities, our cities, our nations, our world... If we want them to love each other, they have to see it from someone. And church, I am, I am challenging you to model it for them. We have to be the agents for Jesus Christ, to point people to him, because he is the only one who can show them and have them experience real freedom. Church, this is the fast that God has called us to. Being his hands and feet is not easy. It's not pretty, but it's necessary. Back to that, um, <laughs> that infamous day that I ended up eating when I should have been fasting. I remember the feeling of guilt, feeling like I had failed, feeling like I had let my family down, my church down, and God down. But I want to say this to you. Maybe, maybe that's been your story. Maybe you've struggled with simple practices, spiritual practices. Maybe you struggled to come to church. Now, obviously, you didn't this morning because you're here. <laughs> but maybe it's coming to church sometimes is a struggle. Maybe praying is a struggle. And there have been times in my own life where I felt like I was so far from God, and I felt like, how could I even say his name? But then when I did, he was right there listening 
and saying, I've just been waiting for you this whole time. You know, maybe it's been reading your Bible. You know, like I said to you before, our church made a commitment at the beginning of this year that we were going to read our Bible through in a year. And I just want to take this opportunity to tell you that starting back in September 19th at 7 o'clock, that's a Thursday night, I believe, we're going to be starting back our midweek. And the reason I tell you that is because the midweek time is for us to hear and learn of these amazing stories. Stories in the Bible that I loved when we first started midweek and people were reading their Bible and, and they would come on Thursday night and they were like, holy cow, do people, did they really act like that in the Bible? I'm like, yep. Which says there's hope for us because we ain't near that crazy. <laughs> I mean, come on now. I mean, we've read some crazy things in the Bible. People doing some things that, oh, good Lord. And that's what midweek. And I want to challenge you. Put it on your calendar. Make it a point that if you can to be here, to hear and read of these amazing stories. Church, will you be the one who is willing to preserve our future? The promise of our future through the simple practice of fasting. Not the fasting of giving up food necessarily, but the fast that touches the heart of God. The fast that loosens the chains of injustice and feeds the hungry. Are you willing to be his hands and feet? Let us pray. God, you have called us for such a time as this. God, you have commissioned us to be your hands and feet. You've called us to a fast that God is a little different than maybe we heard growing up in Sunday school or church. A fast that, God, I truly believe is the fast that you would have us to, to do. God, today as we enter into Holy Communion, when we gather around this table, God, I can't help but think when you were gathered around your 12 disciples, sitting at this table, knowing that this was the last meal that you would eat before being crucified. God, your message was so simple. Love God and love each other. God, that's what you've called us to do. And I know, I know, God, that seems so superficial sometimes, and it seems so easy, actually, to just love people. But when we love people in action... When we show people that, God, you are there to help, to heal anyone with hurts, habits, hang-ups. God, you are there. You're there to loosen the chains of injustice, to overcome the lies spoken over us. God, you feed us, you clothe us, you shelter us. On the night when Jesus was gathered around his disciples. He took something as simple as bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. Which is crucified for you. He took something as simple as wine. And he said, this is my blood poured out for you. And his message was very simple. To just love God. Love him with your whole heart. You know, I really believe, church, that if we would love God the way he's called us to, I really believe we'd love each other. God, we pray for this communion, this time of holy communion, that God, you would rest on this place. At this time, I'd like to call our communion stewards forward. And I just want to remind you that the ushers will be helping you, lead you from the back to the front. I also want to just remind you that the altars are always open. And maybe you'd like to come forward and, and maybe just say, God, help me love people. Help me to love each other. Church, if... Let me say this, it's not our programs, 
It's not our systems. It's not even our building that will attract people to us. It's his love working in us and through us. The table of communion is always open. It's open to all who are present. Would you come and partake of communion?